There's something about the Great Lakes that seems to draw people in from all across the globe. Not only do these bodies of water hold mysteries that still stump scientists to this day, there's said to be all kinds of monsters lurking beneath those waters. And one that we can even see in video today are these massive and terrifying lake sturgeons. <laughs> they look like some freaking dinosaurs and they've been around since the days of the dinosaurs. But that's not the only thing we have to worry about today, swamp folk. Welcome back to the swamp and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true horror stories from the Great Lakes sent in by viewers just like you. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You know Swamp Folk, it's a hard job out here arm wrestling and tickling the toes of homeless alligators. Sometimes I even get hurt while on the job, and for a long time, I had no one to turn to. I had no idea what to do or where to go. But that was until I found Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm. They have over 100 offices nationwide and more than 800 lawyers. With over $15 billion recovered for clients, Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting to get you full and fair compensation. Submitting a claim to Morgan & Morgan is more like ordering takeout than hiring a lawyer. It's super simple. With Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim without ever having to leave the couch. In eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan. Now, Swamp Folk, I can't tell you what to do with your life, but if you're ever injured and you need the best of the best, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash swamped or dial pound law pound 529 from your cell phone. Again, that's forthepeople.com slash swamped or pound law pound 529 from your cell phone. This is a paid advertisement. Lake Michigan Shipwreck by CSGO Pro. We often sought opportunities to bond and create lasting memories as a young family. So on that sunny Saturday morning, we loaded our car with picnic baskets, beach towels, and sunscreen and set off for a day trip to Lake Michigan. The anticipation filled the air as we drove along the winding roads, eager to immerse ourselves in the natural beauty that awaited us. Upon arrival, we were greeted by a breathtaking sight. The vast expanse of the lake stretched out before us, its sparkling waters dancing under the sun's golden rays. The rhythmic crashing of waves against the shore serenaded our senses, promising a day filled with joy and tranquility. We eagerly scouted the area for the perfect spot to settle down. After a short walk, we found a secluded cove nestled amidst a cluster of towering trees. The lush greenery provided a welcome respite from the summer heat, and the shade cast playful patterns on the ground below. With our little ones already racing toward the water, my spouse and I quickly set up our beach towels, creating a cozy, relaxing haven. The gentle breeze kissed our skin as we watched our children frolic in the shallow waters, their laughter echoing joyfully. As the hours slipped away, we explored further along the shoreline. Hand in hand, we strolled along the sandy beach, relishing the sensation of warm grains between our toes. Our footsteps left imprints that were quickly swallowed by the incoming tide as if erasing our presence from the world. I noticed something peculiar about the water's surface during our leisurely walk. Intrigued, I squinted my eyes and strained to get a better look. Just a few yards away, there was an object that defied explanation. Its shape was grotesque and unsettling, an amalgamation of twisted metal and decaying wood. The murky water lapped against its corroded surface as if eager to claim its sinister secret. The air grew heavy and there was like this sense of foreboding, as if the lake was whispering a warning. Driven by curiosity and a nagging sense of unease, I approached the object very cautiously. The closer I got, the more disturbing it became. Rust-covered chains dangling from the sides, their links clinking eerily in the breeze. A tattered flag, 
fluttered weakly as its peak barely recognizable as a remnant of what it once was. As I inched closer, a foul stench assaulted my nostrils, causing me to gag. The putrid odor hung like a vile specter, a reminder of the darkness within. Trembling, I touched the object, my fingers hesitantly brushing against its cold, slimy surface. That's when I saw it, from the depths of the murky water, lifeless eyes staring back at me. They were hollow and empty, devoid of any spark of life. Panic gripped my heart as the realization set in. I had stumbled upon a long-forgotten shipwreck, its haunting presence resurfacing to claim its victims. The oppressive atmosphere grew suffocating as if the spirits of the shipwrecked souls were closing in around me. Shadows danced menacingly beneath the water's surface, their elongated forms hinting at unspeakable horrors lurking below. In a frenzy, I retreated from the dreadful scene, stumbling back onto the safety of the shore. The once inviting waters now seemed tainted, their serenity shattered by the specter of the shipwreck laughter of my children faded into the distance replaced by an unsettling silence that seemed to mock my terror. As I rejoined my family, I tried to shake off the chilling encounter, immersing myself again in the idyllic surroundings I was in, but the image of those lifeless eyes haunted my thoughts, casting a dark shadow over the remainder of our day at Lake Michigan. The once cheerful atmosphere now felt tinged with an unshakable sense of unease, The waves that had once appeared inviting now seemed to crash around the shore with an ominous rhythm, as if whispering secrets of the lake's dark history. I couldn't help but share my harrowing discovery with my spouse, their eyes widening with the concern and disbelief that I had also shared. We decided it was best not to alarm the children to preserve the innocence of their carefree day at the beach, but the weight of what I had continued to bear in us casting a pall over our family outing. We returned to our chosen spot by the cove to regain some sort of normalcy. The children resumed their play, building sand castles and splashing in the shallows, their laughter ringing out like fragile echoes against the vastness. But the horror I had witnessed lingered, its tendrils seeping into every crevice of my mind. The vibrant hues of the setting sun that once warmed the sky now appeared sinister, casting long foreboding shadows across the water. As dusk settled in, we gathered our belongings and prepared to leave. They had transformed into a canvas of deep purples and oranges, a stark contrast to the earlier brilliance of the day. Reluctantly, we turned our backs on the lake, bidding farewell to its secrets. The drive home was filled with an uneasy silence broken only by the occasional hum of the car engine. The weight of the shipwreck's discovery bore heavily upon our hearts as if it was now a piece of us, a piece of that dark history we had brought home with us, unwilling to let it go. Days turned into weeks and the memory of the haunting encounter still refused to fade. It invaded my dreams, a nightmarish loop that replayed the sight of those lifeless eyes, reminding me of the fragility of existence and the unseen terrors that lurked beneath the surface. In the following weeks I found myself researching Lake Michigan's history, delving into its past, the depths of the waters that I just so needed to know about. Tales of shipwrecks and lost souls filled the pages of forgotten archives, each story a testament to the lake's treacherous nature. It became clear that the shipwreck I had stumbled upon was just one of the many remnants of a bygone era when the waters of Lake Michigan were unforgiving, claiming both the brave and the foolhardy who dared to traverse its vastness. Though time passed and life resumed its normal rhythm, a part of me would forever be connected with that haunting encounter. Once a place of solace and tranquility, Lake Michigan now held a darker, more enigmatic allure. The memory of those lifeless eyes served as a chilling reminder that the beauty can conceal horrors beyond imagination, and that sometimes the terrifying things that we fear and read about in stories lie just beneath the surface, waiting to be discovered. The Shack at the Lake by Kirby Hill
I had always been drawn to the solitude of nature, finding solace in the untouched beauty that lay beyond the concrete jungle. So when the opportunity arose to take a nice little solo hiking trip along the shores of Lake Michigan, I eagerly packed my backpack, ready for an adventure that would free my soul. As I arrived at the trailhead, the morning sun spilled its golden rays across the vast expanse of the lake. The air was crisp and refreshing, carrying with it that faint scent of pine trees as I sat on the foot trail. A sense of excitement mingled with the tranquility of the surroundings, the path stretched out before me, winding through the dense forest promising hidden treasures at every turn. For hours I immersed myself in natural wonders that surrounded me. The towering trees formed a majestic canopy overhead, casting intriguing shadows on the ground below. The forest floor was carpeted with fallen leaves, their vibrant hues dejecting autumn's arrival. The gentle rustling of the foliage beneath my boots was the only sound apart from the occasional chirping of birds. As the day wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It was a subtle sensation, like a whisper in the wind, but it sent shivers down my spine nonetheless. I paused, scanning my surroundings, looking for any sign of movement or life, yet the forest remained eerily still, as if holding its breath. Convinced it was my imagination playing tricks on me, I pressed on, determined to reach my destination before nightfall. But as evening descended, a strange noise pierced the stillness. It was distant faint yet undeniably unnatural. It sounded like a muffled whimper, as if someone or something was in distress. My curiosity, it peaked. I veered off trail, following the sound more profoundly into the woods. With every step, the noise grew louder, yet it didn't seem to grow any closer. It echoed through the trees, bouncing off their trunks and branches, making it impossible to discern its origin. Branches snapped underfoot as I forged ahead, my heart pounding in my chest, a mix of fear and anticipation coursing through my veins. Suddenly, the noise ceased, leaving me standing in an eerie silence. I strained my ears, hoping to catch any trace of its return, and then behind a cluster of trees I saw a flicker of movement. I quickened my pace, drawn toward the source of the mysterious sound. As I rounded the last tree, my breath caught in my throat. Before me stood a dilapidated shack, its wooden planks weathered and worn by time. The air surrounding it seemed heavy, as if carrying the weight of forgotten secrets. The whimpering sound emanated from within, growing louder and just more disturbing with every passing moment. Summoning all of my courage, I pushed open the creaking door, revealing a scene that would forever haunt my dreams. The shack's interior was shrouded in darkness, save for a single ray of light streaming through a cracked window, illuminating a ghastly sight. Lining the walls were rows upon rows of cages, each holding a different creature, a macabre menagerie of twisted nightmares. Some had feral eyes and sharp teeth, and their bodies contorted in unnatural shapes. Others were skeletal and emaciated, their skin clinging desperately to their frames. The stench of decay hung heavy in the air, mingling with the pitiful cries that echoed through the room. Terror gripped me as I realized the true horror of the situation. These creatures, trapped and tormented, were the source of the haunting sounds that I had heard throughout my hike. Someone had inflicted unspeakable, un undeniable cruelty on these, these absolute terrified creatures subjecting them to unimaginable suffering. I could feel their pain resonating into the depths of my soul, compelling me to take action. With trembling hands, I fumbled for my phone and dialed the emergency services. As I relayed the details of the horrific discovery, my voice quivered with fear and determination. The operator assured me that help was coming, urging me to stay put until the authorities arrived. I obeyed, unable to tear away from the pitiful creatures trapped within the cages. Once filled with despair, their eyes now seemed to hold a glimmer of hope as they sensed salvation drawing near. Time waiting there seemed to stretch agonizingly long as I waited for the sound of approaching sirens, yearning for this nightmare to end. Finally, the distant wail of emergency vehicles reached my ears, slicing through the heavy silence. 
relief flooded my being, but I couldn't help but feel haunted by the atrocities I had witnessed. I knew that even as the captives were set free, the scars of their torment would forever mar their existence. The rescue operation unfolded with precision and urgency. Along with animal welfare organizations, law enforcement officers arrived to dismantle the grotesque menagerie and provided medical attention to the surviving creatures. Their dedication and compassion in the face of such darkness rekindled a flicker of faith within me. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an ethereal glow over the scene, I slowly returned to the trail. Once serene and comforting, the air now carried a weight of sorrow. The forest, not so inviting anymore, not like it used to be. I walked with heavy footsteps, burdened by the knowledge that evil could lurk in even the most picturesque corners of the world. The beauty I had once admired now felt tainted, tarnished by the grotesque acts that I had witnessed. The shadows stretched before me, their elongated forms dancing in the fading light, reminding me of the darkness that could consume the purest of intentions. That solo hiking trip that began with a thirst for solitude had transformed into a journey of enlightenment and purpose. Though scarred by the horrors I had witnessed, I emerged with a newfound determination to be the voice for the voiceless, the echoes of that haunting whimper that would forever reverberate in my heart, a constant reminder of the dark that lurks in the world and the unwavering need to bring light to its darkest corners. Lake Huron Spookiness by Anonymous I grew up in the state of Michigan, in a town called Port Austin, right on the great lake of Lake Huron. It's a small town with not much to do besides peruse the small mom and pop shops or go to the diner in the center of town and check out some cool classic cars at the show that is held once a week. Whenever I could, I chose to escape the mundanity and go to my father's cabin in the neighboring city of Grindstone. It was a small community town with nothing but woods and farmland and a nice area for hunting and fishing, once again on the shores of Lake Huron. At the time, I was 14 years old and I went up for the weekend with my older brother, a marine straight out of Iraq, returning home that same weekend from a short hunting trip. My brother was tough as nails, and he wasn't afraid of anything, but that day I would see a side of him I wouldn't soon forget. We took the ATV and headed out to a cornfield with an abandoned farmhouse. To set the scene, we were hunting pheasant in the cornfield that opens up to a clearing, and beyond that is the beautiful Lake Huron. We entered the opposite side, which is smaller, lighter woodsy area, but has a trail where we park the ATV that leads out to the cornfield. We headed out fairly late sometime around 4 p.m. after fishing earlier that day, and hadn't had that much luck, so we were deciding to head back at around 7 p.m. As we were exploring the abandoned farmhouse, my brother sat down for a cigarette and called me over to the front to check something out. His face was pale, and he choked on his words. He told me to look over there and pointed. I saw a huge wolf about 300 yards in the clearing ahead of me, standing on its hind legs. This thing was massive and covered in thick black fur. I couldn't really see how tall it actually was from the distance, but its legs looked huge and this thing was muscular with an oddly shaped torso and long slender hind legs. My brother told me to grab one of the shotguns. When it heard him, it turned and looked exactly at us, seeming to be leering slightly. It then took a few strides on its hind legs then went down on all fours and darted into the cornfield in the direction of our ATV. It was starting to get dark now. The sky was red, purple, and orange. We decided to enter the cornfield from the farthest end that this wolf went into. I was on flashlight duty, so I could see all of our surroundings. While he walked ahead of me with a shotgun the entire time, I felt like I was being watched and I swear I heard nearby rustling and low growls and snarls when we would stop. Eventually, what was a 10 minute walk seemed to take an hour. We made it to the trail where the ATV was parked. I started to calm down now that I could see my surroundings better, and that's when I heard the iconic horror movie cliche of a branch or twig snapping, followed by rustling in the cornfield behind us. I shined the flashlight on a patch of stalks where I thought I heard the movement, 
and sure enough, I saw a pair of yellow reflective eyes about six feet high through a crack in the cornstalks. My brother yelled at it to F off, then it let out an eerie howl that sounded like it was right in my ear. My brother fired one shot, hitting the top of the corn stalks, and then told me to hightail it to the ATV and get it started. I started it, and when I felt him jump on the back after me, I punched a throttle and floored it across to the access road and then onto the main road that cuts through the town. I looked behind me once or twice and saw a huge black mass dart across the road quickly, from out of the cornfield into the darkness of the woods. We headed back to our house, in town that night, and didn't return until about 12pm the next day to collect our things from the cabin, still unnerved. I had always heard the rumors of the Michigan Dog Man, but I always thought it was just an old wives' tale, like the boogeyman that my dad told me to scare me straight as a kid. I thought it was just some state urban legend like the Skunk Ape of Florida or Chupacabra, etc. To this day, my brother and I talk about it over some beers, but it was definitely a scary experience for the both of us. I even still go hunting in those parts to this day, but haven't seen anything since, and I hope that I don't see it again. A Night I Can't Forget by Anonymous When I was about 16 years old, I got a job as a personal assistant slash cleaning lady for a wealthy couple living in a big, beautiful mansion on Lake Michigan. It was a great job then, but after a while, I had to quit because of everything going on, and I'll tell you exactly what that was. I made $12 an hour as a 16-year-old girl, which was just crazy to me at the time. But now I know it's because the homeowners couldn't get anyone to stay to work for them. But I didn't see them all that much during the school year, so it was fine. I would work 40 hours a week in the summer and part-time while in school. So during the school year, I would hardly ever see the homeowners and would be left alone to clean the house. I had a key, alarm, and gate code, so I let myself in and out as I pleased, essentially. In the summer months, I had help from a few other employees, but in the school year, it was just me. At first, I loved being in the house alone. Don't get me wrong. The place was gorgeous right on Lake Michigan, had a beautiful view of it. I'd always open all the curtains to let the sun shine in and blast the surrounding sound speakers while I cleaned. It wasn't until I was alone that I started noticing how weird the place was. Nothing ever felt welcoming about the place. Sure, it was pretty to look at, but it was modern and everything was marble and stone. Not a very homey feeling. My first experience happened when I was cleaning one day in silence. I remember not turning on the music because I had a bad headache that day. Suddenly, the speaker to the upstairs part of the house turned on. The way their speaker system works, you can control it by a touchpad in the kitchen, which would play music everywhere besides the basement and main bedroom. To play music in those areas, you must go to the touchpad, turn it on by the control pad, and sync it up with the rest of the house. The reason this was so alarming was because I was the only one there. I walked up the stairs to check what was going on and figure out why the music turned on, seemingly by itself. I looked around and called the homeowner's name, thinking someone had just come in without me noticing, but the doors were still locked and no one was home. I shut off the music and went back downstairs not thinking too much of it. It started happening more often though. I'd be listening to music and it would turn off, or it would be off and turn on in a completely different area of the house. I brushed it off as faulty electronics and didn't really think much of it. The second most prevalent story I remember from working there was when I was cleaning the workout room in their basement. I never wanted to go into this room, and I couldn't tell you why. Something about this room just felt weird. It was super cold and dark and I felt anxious in that room no matter what time of day. I tried to avoid it at all cost, but my boss would get mad when the dust would build up so I forced myself to go down there once a week to tidy up. So anyway, I was in the workout room using a broom and mop. I remember sweeping the floor and propping the door open against the machine while I used the mop. Suddenly, the broom fell over, hitting the wall, and the baseboard to the floor as it was fell, causing three distinct knocks. What I heard after scared me so badly I refused to go into that room by myself ever again. 
Immediately following the knocks made by the broom falling, three knocks responded in the exact pattern the broom fell, but it was coming from inside the wall. I know what you're thinking. It was not an echo. It was not some sort of scared animal. It was knocking. Deliberate knocking. I was utterly alone in a big, quiet house in the middle of nowhere on Lake Michigan, and someone was knocking back at me from inside the wall. To this day, I have no explanation for what I experienced. Lastly, this was the first and only time I have ever seen anything paranormal with my two eyes. And I know this time it's not me being paranoid or crazy because I was with a coworker who saw it too. Sometimes my boss would rent out her guest house and we would clean it before the guest would arrive. So this guest house has a big glass hallway leading from one main area of the house to another. I was cleaning the house while one of my coworkers, Bob, was standing next to me. Just then, I catch a glimpse of what looked like a boy in a blue shirt running by. I turned my head just as Bob turned his head as well. He asked me if I saw that too, and I said yes. Thank you for sharing my stories. Hopefully everybody enjoyed them. Concert Creeper by Anonymous So I was in 7th grade and really into music and going to concerts. My dad told me we could see Bad Finger and War at a free show in Toledo, Ohio. As far as I know, they have this concert every year. It's called Party in the Park and takes place at this lovely park right on the banks of Lake Erie. I was a little hippie who wore rose-colored glasses. My favorite band was the Beatles, so of course, I was ecstatic to see a band that had been signed to Apple Records, and I was also psyched to see War, as I love Lowrider and Spill the Wine. If I recall correctly, Bad Finger was playing one day, and then, a day or two later, War played. I think I also had the opportunity to see Blue Oyster Cult, but I passed. So anyway, I went to Bad Finger, I got my picture taken, and an autograph from Joey Molland. So I was in my 60s music nerd heaven. My dad kept wandering off to get food or beer or speak to people he knew in the crowd. My mom probably would have flipped out if she'd known that my dad was leaving little teen me unattended at a free concert in Toledo, especially on the banks of Lake Erie. A lot of crazy stuff happens here, but I didn't mind a bit because I was feeling like a grown-up and independent. After all, I'd just met an absolute rock star, so obviously, I was okay, and nothing terrible would ever happen the same day something so extraordinary happened, right? It got dark very quickly after the concert, and I really wanted to go home but my dad kept running into people he knew and chatting with them. He bumped into some guy, and the guy tried to show him his new boat, parked or docked or whatever, right there within sight of the stage at this concert. I was pumped to get on this boat and hang out. Still, there were all these super hot older men, by which I mean two guys who were probably 17 with slightly above average looks, on board. I was shy and clumsy, and I worried I would struggle to get onto the boat without falling over. So I said I'd hang out with inside of the ship and people watch, and my dad was like, cool, whatever, let me on that boat. I was standing there probably cheesing, pondering just how fantastic my day had been when this guy walked up to me and kind of punctured my happy little cloud. He was almost seven feet tall, solid, and a little chubby. He looked to be in his late 30s or early 40s and gave me the creeps. I also didn't like him because he looked very much like Mark David Chapman. And as previously stated, I was all about the Beatles at the time. Stephen King met and signed an autograph for Mark David Chapman not too long before MDC shot John Lennon. Stephen King described him as, The lights are on, nobody's home, the house is haunted. This guy had that look going for him. At this point in my life, I had never really been approached by strangers. And I just spoke to him like I would have spoken to anybody else. He asked me about the concert, and I happily chattered away. Then asked where I was from, who was with me, I pointed out my dad, and then he asked me if I had a boyfriend. At 13 years old, I didn't know yet whether to answer this creepy guy's questions, or really much about dating. But when somebody asked me if I had a boyfriend at the time, my answer was always going to be no, obviously. I told him that I didn't have one, and I didn't really want one, you know, I was 13. He started telling me how beautiful I was out of nowhere, and how my face was beautiful, how my body was beautiful, and how I seemed so much more grown up than 13, and all the while, he was looking at me in a way that made me feel like I was going to throw up. 
I have never been looked at like that by anybody, and never really since. It wasn't one of those looks where like, oh, I'm infatuated with you. It was one of those looks that, ooh, you're my prey. And of course it would have to happen from a gigantic man that could easily overpower me and do whatever he wanted. He started reaching toward me, and I kept taking steps back while talking to him because I was raised to not be rude. I was so afraid and so disgusted by how this man was looking at me that I was nearly in tears. Then out of nowhere, my dad came running up and said he had been looking for me and we had to leave right away. This guy ran away, I mean sprinted. He was clearly not up to anything good. I saw his eyes when my dad ran up and he looked genuinely afraid, like a deer caught in the headlights. My dad is useless about talking about anything complicated. He had a rough childhood that he never really talks about so he just started chatting all sunshiny about where we were going to eat. I tried to shake off what had just happened and felt so bad, but when we got to the restaurant, I had to go off to the ladies room and cry. I was too innocent even to be afraid that I might have been kidnapped, murdered, or something else. What was messing with my head the most though was how he looked at me. I was so pumped about puberty, which I'd already hit, but the thought of having breasts and all that stuff was fantastic, having hips was excellent, I couldn't, you know, really wait to be an adult. But now, for the first time I'd experienced a feeling of having a female body is almost like a liability. I blamed myself for a while, I felt something about me must be wrong to have made an adult man act like that with me. I know all of that is BS though, but it was a rotten time for me and it took me a long time to get over it and understand and learn and grow. My dad and I never talked about that ever again. I never told my mom or stepdad either. I pushed it out of my mind and didn't even think about it for a long time afterward. I'm just grateful my dad came and scared that guy off when he did, and that he had the decency not to kick that guy's ass right then and there, because I would have been mortified to death, which would have been even worse. Because my dad had a light and a cheery demeanor afterward, I could pretend what had just happened wasn't as dangerous as it was. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true Great Lakes horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them via reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp and stories like yours to help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to slap up that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them multiple times a week on all things natural and supernatural. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. It helps me pick out better stories in the future. If you made it all the way to the end, today's code word is Fuzzy Gorilla. Be sure to comment that down below to confuse anybody who didn't make it to the end. I love seeing the funny things you guys come up with. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top per usual. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. Don't forget to check out that merch store. Check me out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. And I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.